we have to look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is a very, very useful diagram for modeling the positions of stars in terms of their brightnesses and their colors and so on. And we'll look at this now. Now, we're going to plot a graph of the, the closest, I think it was 100 or 1,000 stars, that we the brightest 1,000 stars, and find out where they go on this axis. Um, so we take, we basically make a scatter graph with a point for each star. What are the axes? Well, on Y we'll have the luminosity or the um, the absolute magnitude of how excellent, how bright the star is. And on the X axis we'll do uh, the spectral class, you know, O, B, A, F, G, and so on, and so on, or the temperature. It's a measurement of the same thing. So we're going to take a, a star and we take the sun, for example, which will be somewhere in the middle because it's a, a, an average um, spectral class of star. It's a, a, a G star and it's got an average brightness. And we'll look at all the stars and we'll plot them. And this is basically the axes that we're going to use. This is the luminosity, or we could say the absolute magnitude. And this is the color index, or we could say the spectral type, or rather the temperature. You see, notice that the, the spectral class, which is M, is around 3000 Kelvin, and so on. G, which is like our star, is between 5 and 6000 Kelvin. We have stars which are 10,000 Kelvin and 30,000 Kelvin, and so on. So, we're going to take all the stars and start plotting them on this. Where do you think the bright stars are going to be? The bright stars are obviously going to be uh, the ones near the top with the highest absolute magnitude. Where are the cool red stars going to be? Well, if it's cool, then it's going to be um, on this side here on the right. But reds tend to be giants, so they tend to be very bright as well. So red giants are going to be in the top right hand corner. Actually, to the top right, because red giants are large. About the blue stars, they will obviously be uh, on this side of the spectrum. They tend to be either here or here. But they will be on the left. So, this is how it is. Um, our sun is somewhere in the middle around here. Okay, I said uh, 100 or 1,000. 22,000 stars were plotted from a satellite, Hipparchus, which was able to uh, uh, catalogue all these stars. Um, and then they plotted them on this. And then as we plotted the stars, we started to see a pattern. This is the stars being plotted. Now, as you see, most stars appear to be in this this leading diagonal here. These are called the main sequence stars. Our sun is roughly here. Um, and if you go further this way, the stars get bluer and brighter. Here, they get redder and dimmer. Then we have some stars that go up here. These are the, going to be the red giants. So some stars come from the main sequence and go up to be red giants or red supergiants. These ones down here are white dwarfs because, or in this section anyway, because they're white because of the, the color there, and they're also dwarf, which means they're not going to be very bright. So this is basically the Hertzsprung diagram, and it tells us a lot about the stars, and it's able we're able to use it to model um, the the brightness and and the color of different stars. So we found that um, most stars tended to fall in these main regions of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, not all over the place. Um, you didn't get many stars here, for example, bright blue stars that were as bright as the sun. They did not exist. The most predominant one is this diagonal. This is called the main sequence. And here we have another diagram which shows these. Uh, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or whatever you call it is um is a red supergiant up here but along with Arcturus. It's red, so it's on the, the right hand part of the spectrum of, of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. It's also very, very luminous, so it's right at the top here. 
Deneb and Rigel are also very luminous stars, but they're not red, they're blue. We have some other stars here, such as uh, Beta Centauri, which is also very blue and very, very bright. And also we can get an idea of the masses of the stars. This is a star which would have um, 60 solar masses, which means it would be very blue and very, um, very hot. Um, one thing about this is that um, because they're so, these stars here, because they're so big and so bright, they burn themselves so quickly. Um, this has a lifetime of 10 to the 7 years. Something here would have a, a, lifetime, not, uh, a lifetime of 10 to the 6 years. They would only last a million years. This one would only last 10 million years. Well, the dinosaurs died 50 million years ago. So our sun is much older than that. But these stars, if they're big and they're blue, they're not going to last for very long because they, they burn each other, they burn themselves out too quickly. These stars down here are much more stable, they're much cooler, they're much smaller, the pressures are not as great, the temperatures are not as great, so they burn much, much slower. Okay. Um Here's another example of the hertzsprung russell diagram. This is this leading diagonal, the main sequence. We've got these uh, red giants here, these red supergiants up here. Rigel, Deneb, these blue supergiants here. And we have these uh, white dwarfs down here. So you are here aware on the sun, which is there, which is one solar mass. And it's a G2 star. The temperature is almost 6,000 Kelvin. Here we have the same again. You will be able to. You will need to be able to um, sketch the main areas of the Hertzsprung Hertzsprung Russell diagram and sketch the um, or label the axes. One interesting thing is that in during the the aging of a star, it starts from the main sequence. It becomes uh, a subgiant, becomes a red giant, then it comes back again, and then it starts uh, burning the helium, and then goes to this part here which becomes a red supergiant or it could become a red supergiant and then it moves this way it heats up and it gets hotter as it goes this way then all of a sudden the outside of the uh, star will float off into space and then it becomes what's called a planetary nebula and what's left behind is very hot but then moves down here very quickly because its luminosity drops off very quickly as the, the outside layer of the star, the planetary nebula, uh, spreads out away from the star and cools off. So it stops uh, being so luminous and then it drops down here to be a white dwarf here and then just cools down. But we'll do more about that later.